Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. This week's video is about our first official book club. So yay to us. And if you were watched my last chat, my last video or watched my stream recently, I've told you guys that I'm reading The Buddha in the Attic written by Julia Atsuka. The book covers Japanese picture wives who were sent to America on a boat. They were, they found their husbands in, through a matchmaking service and their husbands lived in America. So the only form of connection these people had and the, the only form of trust that was built to solidify this as a real person was a Polaroid picture. One given to the man and one given to the woman and a stream of letters that was given back and forth and it turned out as you can only imagine to be for the most part a terrible experience initially and of course as the years go on and as the book goes on they they begin to adapt into american culture and they begin to adapt to their new situation in life there's two quotes in the epigraph the first quote says there be of them that have left the name behind that their praises might be reported and some there be which have no memorial who are perished as though they had never been and are become as though they had never been born and their children after them. This is very strong. In short, this is separating people in groups of, of who they grew into. In the beginning, it references the group of people who found their claim and may be praised and may have a slot in history and can, re can be remembered. And the second portion, it refers to a group of people that didn't have a, a claim, a stake in the world, and they're basically living day by day. And although they may not be remembered, they are here living. And so are their legacies, their children. That's how I, I interpret this quote. I feel it's very straightforward, but it is, as you heard, it's written semi-elaborately. And the second quote says, Barnes burnt down. Now I can see the moon. I find that very powerful. I feel my interpretation of this is saying the illusion is gone. And the reason why I say that is when, it, when a child is home, home is where life makes sense. You're taught the world through your parents' eyes and with the subcontext of your of those before them and being home for so long or in whatever you may call home you just understand life differently but when you leave that home and you enter a new one or when that home is taken from you you can finally see the big picture what's in front of you and Although the moon is beautiful, it is still surrounded by darkness. It's a light surrounded by darkness. So I just interpret this as the illusion's gone and now you get to see the life ahead of you that's gonna be filled with trials and tribulation, but there's always gonna be a light guiding you. The girls that were on these boats coming to America were as young as 12, 13 years old. And some of course were older around the age of 30, if I'm not mistaken, but these are very, these were very young children. And could you imagine just being sent across the map, just in hopes of marrying someone who can save you? Uh, I would like to mention that the setting in this is the early 1900s, so about 1901 to 19, excuse me, 1908 to about 1921 that this book takes place. So the early 1900s to the 1920s is when these people are finding themselves in this situation and it's, it's quite, it, get, it gets pretty sad. And I would like to read a passage from the book where you can see 
the excitement that these women had because they're told that th these men, some of them are doctors, some of them own companies. Some of these men, they, they own a huge house that they have, they have basically everything in a white picket fence waiting for just a bride, just a wife. It says here, on the boat, the first thing we did before deciding who we liked and didn't like, before telling each other which one of the islands we were from and why we were, we were leaving, before even bothering to learn each other's names, was compare photographs of our husband. They were handsome young men with dark eyes and full heads of hair and skin that was smooth and unblemished. Their chins were strong, their posture good, their noses were straight and high. They looked like our brothers and fathers back home, only better dressed in gray frock coats and fine western three-piece suits. Some of them were standing on sidewalks in front of wooden A-frame houses with white picket fences and neatly mowed lawns, and some were leaning in driveways against Model T Fords. Some were sitting in studios on stiff high back chairs with their hands neatly folded and staring straight into the camera as though they were ready to take on the world. All of them had promised to be there, waiting for us in San Francisco when we sailed into port. They're, com they're not even worried about whose name. Sally, Susan, Victoria, etc. Not worried about it, look at my man, right? Look at him, he's gonna take care of me. That's it. That's all she wrote. And then you, you add the fact that you can see how comfortable they feel with the fact that they look like their relatives. And that's mentioned here in the book quite a few times where there's just that sense of comfort in seeing someone who looks like you. And they refer to it so often that I find it interesting. I also found it interesting that they, the women are so, the way that they're represented is, I, I don't know if the, the correct word is docile, but very appeasing and very strong women but a silent strength that just amazes me because the amount that they had to endure was just, it's just unimaginable for me. And most of these women, they can keep a secret. And it's, some of these women in this book, they, they, they could keep a secret. But as the book goes on, their journey, might I add, this was the early 1900s and their journey wasn't a day, two days. This was several weeks and it took them quite a long time to get to San Francisco, to get to that port, to finally meet their husband. And as they were on that boat taking the trip, a lot of them were just missing home. They were questioning, was this the right decision? Was it really so bad? Why am I leaving? Just, they had so much time on their hands to really just turn everything around, just mentally. They they went from ec extreme excitement to almost dread, almost regret. And they hadn't experienced anything except being on the boat. But again, this was a very long time that they were on the boat to the point where their they began to to smell because they needed to take a shower and some would smell more than others and there there would be an instance where uh, in the book they mention it how some girls didn't want to sit next to her because that girl's foot smelled worse than everyone else's <laughs> so th there are some instances in here in the beginning on the boat at least where there is a sense of, of unity because they were all in it together. They were all experiencing the same excitement. Although there was definitely a class difference where some women from higher societies who were being sent uh, to find their husbands, they didn't really associate themselves with other lowly class people. But 
outside of that 1%, the entire boat of women really found a home in their, their grieving and their excitement. This story alludes to the fact that it, the unity never left, but it divided. It divided into households and it's very again very strong this book has such a strength behind it it's it's so opening that you feel as if you've just gained an ominous friend who's willing to tell you the secrets like you're you're on the inn but the secrets are never of them of them as one it's them as many and I personally appreciate the fact that Julia Tsuka took the time to write this in the voice of we because it still lays privacy on those individual stories and those individual experiences. And while we can shed light on it, we're not exposing, but enlightening everyone else. And as I mentioned before, the women were extremely excited in meeting their new life and the excitement is not only something that they're looking forward to but also regretting because there's so much of that comfort that they're leaving behind at home and the excitement of starting new almost doesn't matter in comparison to having to let go of the current the current there's such a safety with having to go to the rice fields and having to basically be a daughter, be be a member of your society that you're basically taught almost perfectly how to associate with and uprooting yourself in any form is frightening, frightening from, from a kid who's finished high school and now going to college and dorming, whether it be five, 10 or miles away it's frightening and to the, the more miles you put between your comfort the more regret the more the more fear that sets into these women but the only thing that kept the bulk of them comfortable and sane was not only the love that they found on the ship not only the unity that they they created while being on the ship while experiencing this with others was that photograph of their husband, that person who promised them freedom. Because these women were coming from Japan, okay? And like I said, there was a class difference. So there were women who were who were, were not really exposed to hard labor, who basically this was a part of the esteem, the aesthetic of being upper class and being with a man who is of the same caliber, although it's across the ocean, it doesn't matter, etc. These other women are hard labor workers who were promised a life of calmness, of content, of, well, well not of content, that's what they assumed that they were going to get, I, but a life of, you don't have to lift a finger right cuz they're getting these letters they're getting they're getting this picture they're putting a face to the words that are saying all the right things and that's what kept them sane but he, i want to read to you their first experience as a whole on the boat we could not have known that when we first saw our husbands we would have no idea who they were that the crowd of men in knit caps and sh shabby black coats waiting for us down below on the deck would bear no resemblance to the handsome young men in the photographs. That the photographs we had been sent were 20 years old. That the letters we had been written had been written to us by people other than our husbands. Professional people with beautiful handwriting whose job it was to tell lies and win hearts that when we first heard our names being called out across the water, one of us would cover her eyes and turn away. I want to go home. But the rest of us would lower our heads and smooth down the skirts of our kimonos and walk down the gangplank 
and step out into the still warm day. This is America. We would say to ourselves, there is no need to worry. And we would be wrong. Their entire, entire safe haven, that thought, that picture, that person that kept them sane was an illusion, was false. And they thought there was some peace in knowing I'm in America now. I'm okay. There's no need to worry. And the fact that he, this is really early on in the book and to their looting and we would be wrong. It's just saddening to think that people come here with lies. I feel there's nothing wrong with telling people about America, giving them hope for their dreams, giving them the ability to dream that there is a possibility of something better, but to lie and to to deceive someone for X reason, it's it's just disheartening. So moving forward, the husbands were not who they said they were, and it was really hard for them to move forward and to really learn who this person is because essentially they were all starting from scratch and these men were not the doctors that they promised to be they were not the the, the high paid x y and z whatever profession they conjured up in those letters in fact these men a good portion of them were hard labor workers and that meant that they were working on a farm and a lot of their living situations were based with, right next to their work. So being promised a big home and then coming basically to a shack, although one can look at it and be happy and thankful, that's what it was. It's definitely disheartening to believe that these women experienced everything that they did. And then their hard work was definitely noticed. It, the Americans on the farms felt that they were a good breed of workers. Here they mentioned they admired us for our strong backs and nimble hands, our stamina, our discipline, our docile dispositions, our unusual ability to tolerate the heat which on summer days in the melon fields of Brawley could reach 120 degrees. They said that our short stature made us ideally suited for work that required stooping low to the ground. Wherever they put us, they were pleased. We had all the virtues of the Chinese. We were hardworking, we were patient, we were unfailingly polite, but none of their vices. We didn't gamble or smoke opium. We didn't brawl. We never spat. We were faster than the Filipinos and less arrogant than the Hindus. We were more disciplined than the Koreans. We were soberer than the Mexicans. We were cheaper to feed than the Okies and Arkies, both the light and the dark. Japanese can live on a spoon, a teaspoonful of rice a day. We were the best breed of worker they had ever hired in their lives. These folks just drift. We don't have to look after them at all. So they find themselves essentially back in the same situation in which they were in when they were in their home countries on a farm working hard. Although, again, I mentioned earlier that there were class differences on the boat and some of the women had never lifted a finger. And that definitely became an issue when they came to America to their betrothed who was a hard labor worker and they also had to go to work so it was very apparent that these women didn't have the skills cap capable and needed for the job at hand and the husbands would either pick up their slack or they would soon find other work elsewhere and not only were they great workers, but they in turn became great farmers. And they were not only amazing, they were high performing and it became a problem. Another passage reads, many nights we waited for them. Sometimes they drove by our farm shacks and sprayed our windows with buckshots 
or set our chicken coops on fire. Sometimes they dynamited our packing sheds. Sometimes they burned down our fields as they were beginning to ripen and we lost our entire earnings for that year. And even though we found footsteps in the dirt the following morning and many scattered matchsticks, when we called the sheriff to come out and take a look, he told us there were no clues worth following. And after that, our husbands were never the same. Why even bother? At night, we slept with our shoes on and hatchets beside our bed while our husbands sat by the window until dawn. Sometimes we were startled awake by a sound, but it was nothing. Somewhere in the world, perhaps a peach had just dropped from a tree. And sometimes we slept straight through the night. And in the morning when we woke up, we found our husbands slumped over and snoring in their chairs. And we tried to wake them gently, for their rifles were still resting on their laps. Sometimes our husbands bought themselves guard dogs, which they named Harry or Spot, and they grew more attached to those dogs than they ever did to us, and we wondered if we had made a mistake coming to such a violent and unwelcoming land. Is there any more any tribe is there any tribe more savage than the Americans? So initially they were praised for their hard work because they were essentially cheap workers and their hard working, working ethic and their steady and consistent paces was beneficial because it was making the Americans money, the farm owners, the landowners. But once they became a direct competitor, a threat, not a worker, a competitor, they were attacked. They're, their, as you saw here, that their chicken coops were set to fire, they were raided, it was, it became such of an issue. And it's sad to think that not only are they thinking, is this a mistake because this man is not who, who I thought he was, but this land is not what I thought it was. America is not the saving grace I thought it would be. And as we continue on, the women changed. They no longer felt themselves. They were thrown through tragic experience after tragic experience. Most of these women, I'm pretty sure, suffer from depression and the way that they carried themselves throughout this book, I, I just would assume that they'd never fully express their, their emotions properly. There would be times where the women would have outbursts with their husband and Either they'd be crying about a lost love because again, they found love on the ships or they had love back at home, but the American picture bride saw, they saw an opportunity. And the book goes on to read that they stopped wearing makeup. They lost themselves. The makeup to them, they would describe it as snow, snow on the peak of a mountain because they worked outside all day and they no longer could wear the same shade of concealer and it wouldn't make sense anymore. So they just stop and they put their mind to their work. Not only were they looked at as competitors and they needed to get taken down, but in the streets, in the everyday life, in the streets, they would be treated as second-class citizens. And the advice given to the wives by their husbands was that the the only way to resist is by not resisting. Again, move on forward being extremely polite, which honestly is completely admirable because how much can you take by the looks of this book? These, these brave women took so much, they endured so much and they lost themselves completely. Some of them went on to be maids, others hard labor workers, and there was a few deaths mentioned in the early chapters about one woman not being able to bring herself to loving anyone else because she found love on the ship and she gave her life to the sea. And another woman, she was 
taken advantage of. And she performed the same act, except she had already been in America and she just walked into the beach and the ocean and she was never seen again. This book does a great job of honoring those lost souls along the journey by not by giving them names. Not every again, this book is written in the voice of we. And only sometimes is it switched over to some girls. But overall, it's so far still such an amazing read as I remember it being the first time. I highly recommend it, although there is going to be a part two of it where I explain the second half of it. I did touch on certain things and I read about two, about three or four passages here just so you can get the full scope of the emotional trauma that these women went through. And I left out some bits and pieces of the physical trauma because it's quite intense. But as you can imagine, these women were raped. These women were fully taken advantage of from mental, physical, emotional, and they were completely just, they found their strength and they found their place. And I am thankful to know that we, they're so, they're so telling of the true American story because the true American story in my eyes is one of overcoming, of, of persevering, of, of finding a way to fight against what's stopping you from growing. And they definitely are examples of persevering against all that stops you. They saw an opportunity and they grabbed it. And once they took that opportunity, that opportunity was masked behind illusions, behind lies. But somehow, although they felt that they lost themselves, I personally feel like they found a new part of themselves they didn't know existed. The part of them that just, the, their strength, they found the strength they would never know they needed. Because we still have people here today who maybe they can't tell their story, but their children can. So I'm very excited to read the second half of this book and I'll catch you on the next video. Thank you so much for watching and if you enjoyed the content please feel free to like and subscribe and share with your friends. Also I am taking book recommendations so if you're interested in me reading anything else that you have in mind please let me know. Blessings from mine to yours.